Welcome to Shovel Talk, a podcast for economic developers, from your friends at the Golden Shovel Agency. All right, folks, Shovel Talk is back after a brief summer hiatus. Um, We had some vacations going on, and we took a little break, but we're back with a great guest that we'll introduce here introduce here shortly. Um, Generally, we start our podcast wondering where in the world Amanda is. Well, Amanda's back in the States, so we'll get back to her um, when she's off on her next adventure here at our next podcast. But Bethany recently took a two-week vacation, believe it or not. Um, Actually, to me, it sounds maybe a bit like a nightmare, but for (laughs) Bethany and her family, it was a vacation. So Bethany, why don't you tell us where in the world you were for the past couple of weeks? Oh, definitely. And it was a lot of fun. Um, Darren's nightmare is another person's fun. (laughs) So I'll give you, I'll give you guys some clues. So my husband and I put our seven kids into the 15 passenger van and drove to a land that is very magical. In fact, once we arrived at this magic land, we boarded a ship and headed for a galaxy far, far away. So that was one of the things that we did. In addition, we ended up flying in Pandora of all places and making sure that at one point we were shrunk down to miniature, so small, in fact, that even Buzz and Woody were significantly larger than us. So those should give you some clues, people. Those were great clues, Bethany. That was that... (laughs) That was a great explanation. <laughs> and, and we will share pictures of these incredibly magical places on uh, Golden Shovel's Facebook page if you guys want to check them out. All right. Well, maybe you convinced me. I don't know. We'll see. I'll check those out on Golden Shovel, on the Golden Shovel social media accounts to see if maybe um, my perceived nightmare was actually a <laughs> wonderful dream. <laughs> so, so Amanda, do you want to introduce our guest, our new, our um, upcoming guest? Absolutely, Darren. We have an exciting guest today. Uh, Actually, one of our longest standing clients, uh, we have Lisa Hurley with York County Development Corporation. She is a certified economic developer and has some very, very exciting news to share. So we'll get right into it. Here's Lisa Hurley. Well, Lisa, we are so excited to have you here with us today, especially given that you had some really exciting news recently, so it's fantastic timing. I heard that you have been named the Economic Development Professional of the Year. I have by the Nebraska Economic Developers Association. That was last week and it was pretty exciting. They do two, one for communities and one for our partners. So I get the community one. It was very, very, very cool. And yeah, I'm excited really to be here. <laughs> yeah. No, and, and again, congratulations on the award. So I, I kind of asked you beforehand, but were, were you surprised or is this something that you had put in for to give us a little more of the details? I was nominated. I was actually nominated by um, my local community, my um, Derek and my staff and a couple of my exec committee members. They worked with Deb here as well, and I had no idea the nomination went in until I got a call from the NIDA board president that I had received it. So give me a heads up um, so I can bring my husband, but I had no idea the nomination had been submitted. That's awesome that they went ahead and did that without giving you a heads up. That was a really nice surprise then. It really was, and it's an honor to be uh, nominated by your local community and your board and staff. Oh, absolutely. People that work with you every day, they get to see, uh, (laughs) behind the curtain, so to speak. They get to see all of my moods. (laughs) Right. (laughs) No, that's great. So Lisa, tell us about a little bit about your background and how you got into economic development. Okay, I actually started more on the nonprofit world with um, emergency services back in the early 2000s and got brought into grant writing and public relations and fundraising. And we relocated for my husband's job and I applied for a position that was in the paper and all it said was strategic planning. I could check that off, strategic planning, um, community building 
grant writing, uh, public relations, stuff like that. I had no idea what I was applying for, to be completely honest, Amanda. <laughs> Um, but that was in 2005, and I started for an economic development district at that point, and they sent me through Heartland and the Economic Development Institute, and I, I went, went from there. I've been in York, um, York, Nebraska since 2013. That's great. It's interesting how there's intersectionalities between the nonprofit world and what you do in economic development, especially when yeah. it comes to the funding and the strategic side. It's there's a lot of crossover. And I I don't that's something I've been trying to educate at the local level, trying to make sure we're partnering with our nonprofits, especially when it comes to workforce, because our nonprofits are working with the clientele that I had worked with in the early 2000s, and they know who is actively looking for a job or trying to find training to step up. And they also know the ones that are, are not. So that intersection of the identifying who's, for lack of a better word, a good target to market to on some of our positions in the community, I'm a mentor for one of our executive directors at one of the nonprofits because I've been an executive director since 2008 and I worked for a nonprofit before and I've been on his board. I'm off of it now, but it's, it's just, okay, how do I work this through mm -hmm. the communication to the boards, the communication to the community? I mean, it's stuff that we do every single day. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right. There's a lot of tie-ins. If you're an executive director or CEO, president, whatever the position's called, you're you're doing the same things, even if the profession's different. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually think that it's really interesting what you said in regards to working with nonprofits as well to help solve some of the economic development challenges. Mm -hmm. That's that's really key insight, how you said they, they really have that direct contact uh, with workforce as an example. And that's such a pressing issue right now. It is huge. Workforce, daycare and housing. I'm working with the nonprofits on all three issues. And okay. we can't solve it by ourselves. It takes the collaboration. Well, and it's interesting because working obviously as a team, you are able to bring more resources to bear to solve these issues. Yep. And what we were going to ask you, obviously, with you being uh, you know, economic development professional of the year, what some <laughs> of your best practices are. Uh, you talked just now about collaboration. I'm assuming that has to be one of the things on your list. Collaboration is probably number one, whether it's collaboration with the communities, with the city or village staff, county staff, or it's collaboration with the businesses themselves. We have a manufacturing group in place before COVID hit. We already, they were able to step forward and how do we help each other? You know, you can't get gloves. How do we or masks or whatever it was, and one company could. So they they work together. So that collaboration, whether it's the day to day ha having to pivot during an emergency, um, it is absolutely critical. And you know, I already talked about the nonprofits. Uh, one thing I'm pretty firm on is updating our strategic plan every year, and I'm. I probably go overboard. We not beyond our strategic plan, we have our marketing plan, we have our content strategy, and then we even have a calendar that Derek and I use internally uh, to make sure that we're we don't miss National Women's Business Day, or uh, we don't get up until mid September and oh crap, National Manufacturing Day is on the on the first. So that is something we we try to kind of plan out the year. And then my staff gets together, I'd like to say weekly, um, but sometimes we skip a week if we're very busy with meetings or schedules or travel or whatever. But we try to get together on a regular basis so we're talking about what's going on. That's awesome, those are great tips. Thank you for sharing. 
I noticed, <laughs> I noticed um, on your LinkedIn, uh, you have a couple of, of licenses, certifications, and um, you're a certified economic developer and a master economic developer practitioner. I yes. uh, wanted to see uh, if you could share with us a little bit about what those are, um, you know, how maybe how you went about getting those, if there's economic developers out there that aren't certified who might be interested in checking that out. So IADC, the International Economic Development Council, runs the certification program for the certified economic developers. And that you're required, you can either go through IADC or you can go through programs like EDI, which is Economic Development Institute. And that's the way I went. And then once you're through the course and you've been in the field for a minimum of, I believe it's now four years, that you can take the test and it's a three-part test, but you have to do a lot of studying beforehand because what's, you know, you take those tests. So, or you, you take the tests after you've been in for four years. So you've had three or four years of classes and you just have to make sure you're ready to go. Just like you would be taking a CPA test or whatever license it is, you have to make sure you're ready to go before you take the test. It was eye-opening to me. Uh, they've changed the testing procedure some, but I would absolutely do it again. Uh, I learned so much, Amanda, just by reading the books and practicing on the writing side so I can make sure I can pound out the essay questions. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so how, how would you say, um, just for anyone, uh, you know, maybe looking at doing that, how, how would you say it's helped you in your career as an economic developer? And it's given me credibility. Mm-hmm. You know, we, some people go the master's route uh, in economics or whatever, but for me, Mine has been the economic development training specifically. So it's given me the credibility, which has helped that that helps me when I came to this job. The fact that I've gone had gone through all the training, I hadn't Mm -hmm. passed the test yet, which I did my fall first fall here. But beyond the credibility, the credibility was based on the knowledge that I did from all the studying. Mm-hmm. And on top of that's the network. You know, I passed mm-hmm. the test back at the first time, well, back in 2013. I've had it recertify through education seminars. You have to do that every five years. When I graduated from EDI, the Economic Development Institute in 2012, that was nine years ago. When I passed the test in 2013, I think it was December of 13. The people I attended EDI with, I still, I mean, we're scattered all over the nation and Mm -hmm. we still, we have uh, text groups. We see each other at conferences. We, Mm -hmm. we call each other, Hey, I'm running into this. And that is incredibly valuable because nobody in, in a rural community that I live in, nobody here even my board members truly understand what the best practices when I am running into an issue. Mm -hmm. And I can, I can call one of my friends that I went through EDI with and, and say, Hey, I'm running into this. This is what I'm thinking of doing. What Mm -hmm. do you recommend? And we can talk it through. It gives me somebody that has gone through it, has, and then gone through the test as well. It's mm-hmm. it's powerful. Those relationships, in addition to the knowledge, and the whole basis of the certification is they've trained you, and you've passed the test that shows they can take you and drop you in any size of community. Mm. And you can you can create and run a successful EDO. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, it's it, continuing in education is so, so important. And then, of course, uh, attending the conferences and making those connections with people that are doing the same same thing that you're doing. So, yeah, yeah. that's that's awesome. Very cool. You know, one thing that's really interesting when you talk about having that professional network 
is the concept of having people you can bounce things off of. Um, mm-hmm. I know one of the things that you've mentioned in the past is it's really important for economic developers to learn when to say no. Uh, are, do you run different concepts or ideas by your network as part of that decision-making process? Or, or what do you suggest for people to know when to back away? Um, I do sometimes I'll call, I have a couple, two, three different people I talk to regularly. Um, I have, I actually worked with a coach for a while. I have an issue. And if you look, looked at my LinkedIn profile, you see, I'm on a number of committees, a number of boards. (laughs) Um, I took at one point, I think I was on seven, seven different boards. Wow. Wow. And I started working with a coach because honestly, I was completely, totally burned out. And I knew if I was going to stay in economic development, which is what I'm trying to do, and it's truly my passion, that I I needed to figure out how to balance myself a little bit better. Mm-hmm. So I really had to identify my why. Why am I doing this um, professionally, but not only professionally, but how it ties to myself individually and my family. And after I went through that whole process, uh, I did learn that part of a blessing of knowing yourself is knowing when to say no. Mm -hmm. And when you really care about making a difference, it's hard to say no, because you can see how everything can make a difference. (laughs) Right. <laughs> and I how everything understand. can tie together, as you mentioned earlier. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, I completely but, understand. I, I suffer from the same same issue back in my economic developer days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was going to ask your coach, is this specifically um, an economic development coach? Is this a life coach? What kind of? A business coach. A business coach. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. I, uh, I was lucky enough to get invited into this program that happens in Nebraska that teams you up with a group of people for a couple of years and it comes with professional development um, funding that are not professional personal development plans with funding behind it and that's um, I used part of that money to partly pay for her I, I had to come up with a little bit of extra, but I still work with her off and on. We partner together a lot. She's become a really good friend. She did not know much about economic development, but she's a, a business owner. Um, her and her husband have owned many businesses. So I mean, she's an entrepreneur. So she understands that mindset. And just a good lady. I mean, she calls me out of my crap. <laughs> we all need someone who does that, right? Um, yes, we do need somebody to call us on our crap and we're making excuses and to hold us accountable. You know, if I tell her one month that I'm going to do this and she comes back next, next month and asks me how, how it's gone and I say I haven't done it, it, it just made me more accountable. Sure. Made sure the follow-up got, whether it was to her or to myself, uh, or to my community, my county, my follow up got better. Mm-hmm. Definitely, and that kind of so this kind of leads into um, a question, the next question that we had, uh, which is how you manage stress and and mind mess. And I know having a coach there, someone as a kind of a check in monthly, um, is really great for uh, managing stress and um, just having that check in is good. Anything else? Any other tips that you have uh, for managing stress? And as an economic developer, you have you know several projects on your plate at once. Um, um, anything, any other tips? <laughs> well, you know, part of it is learning your why, learning why you're doing so you can say no and knowing what works for you in managing that stress. Um, I, uh, I'm trying to think how to say this. One thing, this may sound silly to some people, but I rely heavily on essential oils for, um, for stress and sleeping. And that is something I do on the side as well, but it was the simple things of learning how 
to take some deep breaths before I go into a meeting that might be a bit contentious or before I go to do a presentation, you know, getting my mind in the right frame and being able to recognize when something didn't go my way, um, what items I could control and what items I couldn't. And to kind of analyze and go, learning to be okay with, okay, I couldn't control that. And I told my kids, I've raised them, you know, I've always asked them what, uh, about the control. You can only control what you can control. You can't control other people's options. I had to learn to live by that. And as I've done that, it's become much more easy to correct myself when my mind starts going down that rabbit hole mm -hmm. and getting in the messy area of where I'm criticizing myself or getting on someone else, you know, learning what can I control? I don't know if that answered it, Amanda. <laughs> yeah, no, that definitely. Definitely my mind over matter. It's all it's yeah, mind is, it a, is. strong. <laughs> and you know, some some people use exercise. I mean, that's mm -hmm. why I said you gotta learn what works for yourself. I don't like to run. <laughs> I can I am with you. <laughs> <laughs> some people that's their stress relief. Right. right. Uh, so, you know, walk your dog. Use your oils, use your meditation, use your, go lift weights, uh, do whatever works for you, but figure out what works to, to refocus your mind off of the drama, off of the mess, to stop your mind from spinning out and let yourself go to sleep or whatever's, what that mind mess is keeping you from doing so you can move forward. Awesome. Well, I, I, for, I want to thank you for just being authentic with that because it's something that all professionals struggle with is stress and yes. burnout, but no one wants to talk about it. Right. Because we're supposed to be better than that. We're supposed to be stronger and never get too stressed or never get burned out, but that's not the reality. And, and so thank you for sharing what you do. And, and you're right. I mean, it is different for everybody, but so important because, you know, as economic developers, especially the role is so important in the community. You yes. know, if you overburden yourself and you burn out, the amount of damage that is done is so much higher than if you just said no, maybe to a couple of projects or just took a week off or did whatever you needed to do to recenter. You're absolutely right, Bethany. And thank you. I, you know, for myself, it does come back to the being authentic. That's a switch I've made over the last two years where I'm, I'm really trying to make sure all of my actions are authentic. Even it, when I'm in with a BRE or when I'm with my kids, wherever it is, economic development is one of the highest burnout fields and it's because of the stress. And it's being, not being able to separate. And I think it's something that you are completely correct. We're not talking about and we need to talk about because otherwise we're going to lose people. Right. And you lose all that knowledge. I mean, you talked about the process that you went through to gain your credentialing and, and it was years of classes and testing and recertifying. If you burn yeah. out, then the, the community and the industry as a whole loses that depth of knowledge that cannot be recreated by just hiring someone new. No. Mm -hmm the knowledge and the connections as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, exactly. And so that's, that's really an interesting topic. We haven't explored much at Golden Shovel, but just, you know, personal wellness and, and managing stress within the industry is probably a topic worth exploring further. Definitely. So it probably is. A webinar coming on. <laughs> 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 and you know, if you wanted to, Amanda, I could pull out my oil bag and tell you what works really well for me. Yes. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be sending you an email after this. Like, give me some oils, Lisa. I would love to help you out, Bethany. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I, I'm not getting either. <laughs> Following up on, you know, learning when to say no, on the opposite end of the spectrum is what recommendations do you have for deciding what to get involved in, right? Because there's also a lot of exciting opportunities out there. There are. Um, as I've 
it goes back to knowing your why, Amanda. You know, if you know what your why is for yourself and for your organization, that's going to help guide where where you end up with, where you can say yes to. Uh, I come off a couple of boards in the last year, which actually allowed me to say yes to a really cool community project um, to help with the fundraising for it that I would not have had time to do before. It's um, an all-inclusive parallel play playground. And that it goes to quality of place, which we work on, but not as much as we work on other items. But because I took some of that stuff off that really didn't fit my why and the, you know, creating that positive future for my community long term and creating a positive future for my family. I was able to say yes to this playground, which is not a typical economic development uh, project, but it's a 15,000 square foot playground that is going to serve every ability in the community and in the region. So it really ties into the recruitment uh, and retention of talent. I think I got completely totally off, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. It's like, you know, looking at the projects and evaluating how many points does this hit? How many different, you know, economic development uh, areas does this, does this benefit? And, and really looking at the value um, of the project and, and how, how much it, it kind of covers, you know, I, I, that's what I took from, from what you said. Absolutely. And how much of a long-term impact is it going to have? Is it setting mm -hmm. us up for, for the right areas? And then back to, do you have time to do it? Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to do it, you need to have the time to do it right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I want to just quickly take a step back here. You've mentioned finding your why uh, a couple of times. Can you, for anyone who maybe has not, you know, really found their why and um, might kind of might be able to come up with a, this is why I do things, but you know, there's more to finding your why. And so can you share a little bit about, um, you know, if somebody wants to look into this, what the first step would be of, of finding your why? I can, it took a lot of reflection. Um, I, I don't remember what the terms, what the words stand for, but I followed the IGST format and I, I started with kind of me up the, at the top with a line, a vertical line, and then started dropping stuff down from the line. And I'm talking with my hands, which is absolutely ridiculous here. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I started with, you know, my community, you know, I put down everything that was important to me. And then I started comparing them to each other and what was more important. And I tried really hard to get it down to three. Uh, I never got down to three pillars. That's something I may have to do again someday. And I came up with my own vision statement by going through this long process. And then recently I've topped that off by looking at my immigrant, my immigram and my Gallup strengths. I've taken it within the last year, a follow-up test. I've done it before. I've done the colors and I've taken the results and I've gone back back to it. I mean, you can do it as simple as there's forms out on the internet where you print off words and you circle what resonate with yourself but it, it's truly about who what do you believe and what makes you tick and so some resources you know my coaches i have two um kind of ginger johnson um she wrote the uh, ginger wrote the connectivity canon how to connect, why and how to connect with people on purpose with a service mindset. So I, I followed, initially I followed the program within her book. Um, there is, uh, Jim Lupkin has a predictive social media 
And that book is really about being authentic online and sales and stuff. But he has a couple at the front end of the book, he has a couple chapters on identifying why you're doing what you're doing, identifying your core strengths. Because if you know your strengths, you know how to hire for your weaknesses to build a good team. Mm -hmm. And oh, I've read a lot of books. Mm -hmm. I, I could send you a list of 20 books, Amanda, on this. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, that'd be great if you actually would share because we will include that list of your book recommendations with the podcast. That'd be awesome. So Lisa, I think it's time to switch gears a little bit. We wanted to chat more about some of the work that you've done in your community as far as building up your brand, the brand of, of York County. And yes. you had some really innovative social media ideas and started using hashtags in interesting ways uh, and incorporating Instagram before it was more commonplace. Could you tell us a little bit more about your inspiration and what that process was like? Yeah, I absolutely can. Um, the social media actually came as part of our internal marketing strategy. When I, and Bethany, you've seen this you, what, in our marketing plan and our um, concepts and everything. We really talk heavily about your internal and your external marketing plans in our targets. My internal is my, my region, my community, my membership, my investors, my businesses, but overall just my, the residents in the community, because if they're, the more people that know what YCDC is doing, the more people that are gonna support it. Yeah, and that's been, we started on Facebook and Twitter. I'll be honest, Derek does majority of the Twitter. I re rarely don't touch that. And then we added in um, Instagram and we've done videos. We do, we share events that are happening in the community. We share business. Um, uh, let me think of this business announcements and success stories, you know, whether or not we helped on a project, if, if we like to help them celebrate, that's just part of what we do. And we help broadcast the news in the community. And so Instagram and Facebook seem to be, we also have LinkedIn, but Instagram and Facebook really seem to be the two audiences that connect to our internal audience. And we started doing videos, man, probably back in 2014. Wow. And those have been heavy on not just the website, but the shorter ones out on the social media platforms. And sometimes they've been as complicated as we contract with you guys for a VR video. Um, other times they've been as simple as, I grab one of my business owners or I'm in a business and I take some, uh, a 15 second video and upload it right onto Instagram and Facebook. But it, it's just about building our community brand and mm -hmm. also building the YCDC brand at the same time. Because if we don't talk about ourselves, nobody's gonna know what we're doing because so much of what we do we can't talk about. So it's really nice when we can talk about what we can talk about and broadcast it completely out there. It really has made a difference on our community buy-in. And I'll give you a perfect example. And for those people that are analytical and need to see the data, I started, as I said earlier, back in 2013. So I've been here nine years now eight years now, over eight years. We had, uh, I've doubled both our number of investors and the number of investment that's coming in. And I've increased the government funds. And so when you think about it, that would not have happened if the community and the small businesses did not know what we were doing. Right. And we actually have some individuals that are putting money in the pot now too. I think that's, that's awesome. like you said, for anyone who's interested in the numbers, 
uh, show me the money, so to speak, right? <laughs> that yep. really does prove that the strategy works and it's effective. And I think that it's interesting because, you know, when you talk about sharing the success of the local community and highlighting small businesses, even in those 15 second videos on the mm-hmm. BRE visits, whatever it may be, uh, those are excellent ways to gain community buy-in and also to really get other members of the community excited about what's happening in their own backyard. Because, you know, small business owners are busy. They don't have the time necessarily to share of their success. So even if it's not directly related to one of your projects, I can definitely see the value of amplifying their stories. Absolutely. And one that really, I, I we did just a couple months ago, we did a board behind the scenes for a new business that's not quite open yet. And I just in a lobby area, I I took some photos out there so people could see the lobby, they could see the signs, they could see still undergoing construction, but they were not able to see the backside. And I it was just like four pictures that I posted, but it went kind of nuts. And people were telling me, oh man, we love seeing that. We can't wait till we get in there. So it it That's just awesome. it's that community buy-in, Amanda. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And it, um, I love that that you're utilizing video too. That's something that's brought up a lot. I think with clients, um, especially as um, you know, video is one of the top ways that people want to consume information now next to audio is, is quickly rising, but um, video is so important. And so do you have any tips or anything for uh, economic developers or business owners even out there that might be uh, a little hesitant to, to use a video, a little um, nervous to get on, to get on video and share that with our community. Do you have any, any best practices or tips for uh, using video and social media? Um, yes, I do. Actually, I'd like to say just do it, uh, but it's a little, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to admit something here. The very first time I released a video of me talking, you know, I recorded it. Now I do some FaceTime, Facebook lives and Instagram lives, but that video, it took me four hours Wow! to, to get wow. to where <laughs> I was comfortable. I literally mm-hmm. stood in front of my desk with my tripod and I would screw up and I would screw up and I would screw up in my mind, <laughs> talk about my <laughs> mess. And so don't, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> get your tripod if you're going to be doing it in the office uh that helps it keep stable but be okay with the mistakes it just mm-hmm. makes it a little authentic for those right. quick 15 seconds yes when you're working with a photographer a videographer uh you got to be a little bit more on but for these mm-hmm. quick interactive ones be be okay with mistakes Right. And go get comfortable with going live. You really, I, I can't even tell you how many I recorded that day. And mm-hmm. you just got, you just got to do it. And if that's what it takes, spend four hours going over and over and over and over. I usually will have a few things on bullet points. Mm-hmm. I'll, you know, the, the things I want to make sure I've done a sticky under my camera. Uh, I've noticed for myself that when I do that, sometimes I'm looking down and not at the camera. And that is the biggest thing is look at the camera, because if you're looking at your screen, when you're talking on your phone, it looks like you're looking away. So look Mm -hmm. at the camera, do what you need to, to get your breathing under control and just do it. Yeah. I'm so glad that you said, uh, you know, be okay with the mistakes because, and you mentioned authenticity, it really does come down to authenticity. And when the community can see you be authentic, that's so powerful. Very it cool. really is. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I can't stress enough, uh, the power of that when it mm-hmm. comes to building the community support for yep. not only myself, but the organization. Absolutely. They trust me more. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. They know you're human. Yeah. Yep. Oh, well, <laughs> God knows I'm human. <laughs> Aren't we all? My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. We all make our share of mistakes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, speaking of audio, I mentioned audio earlier being uh, one of the kind of it's growing in, in popularity for sure um, as a way people like to consume information. Uh, you have a podcast. We do our 17 <laughs> County podcast and it was something Oh, it's probably been five years ago. Me and one of our local people, he actually works outside of the county, but he, he does podcasts and some other marketing stuff on the side. He's marketing director. Uh, we were friends and we were just throwing ideas off. And I'm like, I want to do a podcast. He's like, well, I can help you with that. And I never had time to do it. I think I told Darren a couple of times, yeah, this is on our list. I think it was in our marketing plan for probably two years. And then when we hired Derek, I had the capacity and I had somebody that was interested in it because it goes back to, yeah, I wanted to do it, but it really didn't fit into my day to do it. And if I'm going to do it for the organization, I want to make sure I'm doing it right. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm going to make mistakes, but I want to, with a podcast, I wanted to make sure it was being done right. And Derek has been working with for two years now, uh, over two years. He works with Mitch. We do seasons. So they do the recording. Our Mitch, my marketing guy that I referred to, he does the editing for us. Um, he's the one that advised us on what equipment to buy, what software to use. And when we have issues with it uploading to Apple or Spotify or whatever it is, you guys know how that goes. Um, mm -hmm. We text him and he gets it fixed. <laughs> awesome. So what kind of topics do you cover? Where, where can people find you if they wanted to check out your podcast? Uh, on our website, yorkdevco.com or on any of the podcasts or audio uh, software out there, such as Spotify or Podbean or apple or whatever it is you use it's just 17 county okay so awesome. what, what we talk about is every season has a topic so this last one that we released this summer uh, i think it was in june was on uh this last one that we released in june was on makers so we, we had a couple of our manufacturers that designed programs that talked. We had um, one of our, we, we, we had a variety of people that are making stuff, whether it's in their garage or on a manufacturing floor. This coming season in October, since it's National Manufacturing Day and our month adopts it as National Manufacturing Month, um, we're doing manufacturing. We have done one on talent where we tell people, let people tell their stories. You know, how, how did they get here? Why are they in York County? And it ties into our broad, broader theme, which I didn't even mention, our Why York County initiative. And that's, the podcast falls underneath that, but it, by telling our stories, how, you know, you grew up in Chicago, what the heck are you doing in York, Nebraska or McCool, <laughs> Nebraska or whatever county or whatever community here in York County. And it's instead of me saying, hey, this is a really good place to live because of A, B and C. Um, I have Tammy from Corteva that grew up in Chicago speaking, or we have Cam from Cornerstone Building, who just moved here from Indianapolis earlier this year to take over a position. Uh, so it's, and then we have those people that grew up here and left and came back. Mm -hmm. So it's all about telling the story. Yeah. Awesome. That was a long answer for you, Amanda. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's great. I think it ties back to the authenticity piece. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's people out there authentically telling their story and how, and, and it, and it, um, it, I mean, it just shows that, um, you know, it's a great place to live and work and, um, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. That whole fa fa phrase, that whole phrase, we're not supposed to use the great place to live, work and play. 
<laughs> get told by every marketing company not to use that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so we're trying to do it without using those words. So we have a, uh, a little game that we play at the end of our podcast uh, called Shovel Toss. And basically, uh, I would um, ask you 10 questions and you would answer the first thing that comes to mind uh, as fast as you can. And if they're pretty much kind of get to know you type of questions, it's kind of a fun, fun game. Um, and so if you're OK with that, we can we can uh, dive into that. I am. It's probably the part I've been terrified of, to be true. <laughs> it's easy, I promise. <laughs> There's no path or fail, don't worry. <laughs> All right. Uh, what is the last book you read? The one I'm reading right now is No Greater Honor. Right. That one's taking uh, me a little bit to get through. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite podcast? My favorite podcast right now is... Front porch sessions. And what is the first thing you do in the morning? I look at my phone, which I'm not supposed to do. <laughs> We're all guilty of it. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Don't is, tell my coach. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, what did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, depends on the age. At one time, I wanted to be an interior designer. Uh, at one point, for quite a long time, I was thinking a psychologist. Oh, awesome. What's your favorite, who's your favorite superhero and why? Mm. Oh man, is that Iron Man or Thor mm, or Wonder okay. Woman? <laughs> awesome. I, and why? <laughs> I, and why? I love that. Okay, Iron Man, let's go there. <laughs> I, I love how inventive he is and how focused uh -huh. he is on getting stuff done. And he, not a superhero by birth, that he just made yeah. it happen. Yeah. So the focus awesome. and the invention. Very cool. And Thor, uh, who uh -huh. can complain with Thor? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you like Marvel just as much as I do. <laughs> oh, I watch them all. <laughs> so do I. Um, what superpower would you want and why? Um, speed, like Flash. And my kids and my husband would probably tell you that I already have the speed if I'm in the vehicle. <laughs> uh, but it's, I like to get things done. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I struggle with just sitting there. So let's move on to the next thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you could live anywhere in the world for a year, where would you live? I would love to explore Italy. Uh, if you could have a meal with anyone in history, who would it be with and why? That's a tough one. I think mm -hmm. uh, President Lincoln. Mm -hmm. I, I've read a, quite a bit about him and how his mind shifted priorities and how he was able to adapt throughout his throughout his term i i I'd, I'd love to have that conversation with them yeah that's cool because if you read the history his mind did it where he started is not where he ended up at awesome uh favorite band or singer when you were a teenager probably Probably Garth Brooks. Awesome. Uh, most embarrassing hairstyle or article of clothing from your childhood. <laughs> oh, this one's good. And my sisters are going <laughs> to laugh that I actually admitted this. So when I was about five, I got impatient. You guys wouldn't believe that now, would you? <laughs> and I cut my hair because I was tired of waiting oh. for my mom to make my appointment. <laughs> I got in real quick. It was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it was very, very short to the front. Let's put it oh, that way. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, that concludes the shovel toss game. Great answers. Thank you for playing. That's fun. <laughs> and and thank you so much for uh, for being on the podcast. This was a great conversation. Loved the tips and the um, info. So thank you so much. <laughs> oh, 
Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it, Amanda and Bethany. Yeah, we thank you for being here. And again, thank you for, for the authenticity and for bringing up some of those issues of wellness that we need to all be talking about. Well, you're welcome. You guys should know by now, anything you ask me is kind of, you're going to get what you get. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I enjoyed this. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you very much to Lisa Hurley, longtime Golden Shovel client and Golden Shovel advocate. You can follow Lisa and her organization on LinkedIn at York County Development Corporation, Facebook at York County Development Corporation, Twitter at York NE DevCo, YouTube, York County Development Corporation. Also, you can check out their podcast, the 17 County Podcast Series, as she mentioned during the chat here. Um, you can follow them on all your favorite podcast uh, resources out there. As far as Golden Shovel news, we have some. We have a new hire, Erin Chadwick, uh, a name that may be familiar to some of you folks out there. She comes from the client side, uh, taking on a new role with Golden Shovel. She is a gatekeeper rep, so she's going to be taking over some of our wonderful clients. Welcome, Erin, to the Golden Shovel team. Also, you may have received an email blast announcing this, but we do have an economic development website website design project planning guide. That's a mouthful. You can get that planning guide at the Golden Shovel website, an easy download if you go to goldenshovelagency.com. As far as Golden Shovel social accounts, we want you to check us out, right? So like us on Facebook at Shovel Toss. Follow us on Twitter at Gold Shovel. LinkedIn, follow us, Golden, Golden Shovel Agency, and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, Golden Shovel Agency. Thank you so much for listening to the wonderful discussion with Lisa. We will be back very soon with a new upcoming podcast called Shovel Talk. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.